Hello everybody and we are back with tier 7 part 2 of the conspiracy theory iceberg. Real quick before we get started a couple things I want to mention. Uh, I now officially have an artist who's going to be doing the work for me. She's actually the person who did my logo design which is my profile picture and the design that went on the sweaters. But it looks like she's going to be doing future designs as well so I'm going to link her information in the description below along with the editor. So if you want to follow either of them I encourage you to check them out. And also even though he may never see this thank you Mr. GG for shouting out my video. It's so wild seeing people that I've watched for literal years um, say me by name and put me on stuff and it really does mean the most. So Mr. GG, if you ever see this, thank you so much. Without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get into this, but as always, thank you for watching. Rapture already happened is in reference to the rapture event mentioned in the biblical text of Revelations. For those that don't know, there's debate among Christian groups of when exactly the rapture is supposed to take place. Not only like what year it will happen, but when it will happen within the actual telling of the end of the world itself. See, there's something mentioned in the book of Revelations known as the tribulation period. This is a period of time in which the earth goes from doing really, really well to really, really bad in a span of seven years. However, if someone was of the belief that, for example, in the book of Genesis, when it talks about how the world was formed, that the world was formed in seven days, that it's not actually seven days and more like 7,000 years, then imagine what seven year tribulation period would actually be. In other words, if you're not literal, with interpretations of time in the Bible, then a seven year tribulation period might as well be 7,000. So in the Bible, when it mentions that during the tribulation period, God no longer interacts with the world, the devil has full control of it, and evil run rampant, and if that is a period of time like 7,000 years, then what's to say we're not currently living in that? As a matter of fact, there are some beliefs that the rapture happened immediately after Jesus' crucifixion, which would mean that we're all living in a devil-controlled world and God won't hear us. So, again, only positive vibes on this channel. Grider's Endgame is in reference to journalist William Grider. Grider wrote from everyone from the Washington Times to the Rolling Stones. However, the work that puts him on his list is his 1987 book, Secrets of the Temple, How the Federal Reserve Runs a Country. The book essentially talks about how there is a secret society that exists underneath the United States government and how they're proliferated through the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve is building up a plan in order to enact a new world order and Illuminati and all that stuff. It's another theory that falls in line with the idea that banking circles are the ones actually running the country and politicians essentially exist as figureheads. Soy spraying and weaponized soy is in reference to the proliferation of soy products in modern industry. If you'll notice in the last few years especially, soy has popped up more and more as either a substitute or a source in different foods and supplements. However, soy itself is an actual estrogen supplement and when consumed by males in large quantities can lead to testosterone deficiency. What the theory is saying is that the powers that be have put soy products everywhere they're not supposed to be in order to demoralize and demasculate their people who could theoretically overturn them if they ever saw fit. You can go further and say that with weaponized soy, that similar to how governments, especially the United States government, has been accused of psyops and long-term chemical warfare over time, the exact same thing but with soy products in order to make the enemy less masculine. So what I'm saying is government-sanctioned weaponized femboys. Yeah, bicameralism comes from a 1976 book written by Julian Jays. Julian had a very interesting theory from where human consciousness came from. His idea was that as early as 3,000 years ago, the original forms of consciousness began to be created, and that before that, the brain was divided into two parts. One part told the other what to do, and the second part acted on it. And while you may think that's how consciousness works on its own, I am saying that it is a very literal one side of your brain communicates to the other, the other side has no thought process and simply carries out an action. This means that there is no form of contemplation, decision making, or thinking in the th way that we would think of it now. One of Julian's references to this is such as the characters that were mentioned in the Iliad never really thought or decided what they were doing, instead they just kind of did 
things. So according to this theory, before the past three millennia, society existed with no meaning of self-awareness. And according to this theory, as society developed, we began to find the need to ask ourselves why, so the two sides of our brain kind of formed over the one that seems to ask questions, and that became the modern form of consciousness. Or in other words, the commanded part of the brain learned to think for itself, and the part that gave commands simply began to ask questions. Staring anxiety is the most literal form of brain rot. According to this theory, staring at any electronic screen for an amount of time will fry your brain, and not in the way that a parent would tell you to stop playing video games they fry your brain, in a literal your neurons begin to shut off and die kind of way. This would, of course, over time make a modern population a lot dumber, so therefore this theory is saying that the reason screens are everywhere around us and proliferated so much is a way for the elites to further control us mentally. Ancient structure purpose is a huge topic to tackle but I can get a few of them out of the way. For example, there are theories that ancient pyramids and cigarettes were actually the beginning of a sort of mining facility. Or in other words, whatever beings actually created them was doing so in order to stage a way to get inside of the earth, maybe even hollow earth. Whereas other theories talk about how societies had these very advanced forms of architecture that doesn't really make sense for the time they were in. For example, in China, people built entire palaces into the sides of cliffs, something that is hard to understand and hard to accomplish by today's means. Furthermore, in Persia, they managed to run water systems off of the top of snow-capped mountains all the way down into their cities in order to have year-round cold water. A lot of this also gets back into the idea of sacral architecture, which is essentially architecture that is created for the sake of a sacredness rather than purpose. So you could think of this as like temples and buildings of religious worship. A lot of them are believed to be too advanced for their time or too advanced for the people that lived around these structures, so therefore some special means created them rather than just the people themselves. And I also have to mention my favorite theory, which I talked about in the last episode, that the Tower of Babel was a launching platform for the Anunnaki aliens to shoot their space ship back into space. Yeah. Real Intentions of the Rotoruda is actually something that I mentioned all the way back in Tier 2. Rotoruda, if you'll remember, is a comic that supposedly has a hidden meaning, saying that our political leaders want to return us to a gold standard in order to leave banking organizations. This all kind of falls back on the idea that banks and politics have hated each other and don't shake hands and get as long as much as we may think they do. However, Real Intentions for the Road of Ruta is an entire game plan for exactly how they're gonna do it. Short version goes like this. Step one, in the 1970s, all of the world's banking systems became ran by computers. Part two, because of this, secret cabals or cults around the world managed to have control of what markets rose and fall and were able to build wealth by riding off of it. Step three, ever since the early 1900s, the United States has been hiding its actual capabilities and resources so that now in the modern day, they can manage to produce false scarcity, creating scarcity among other nations, which then the US can find all of these resources and then maintain themselves as a world power. This is all saying that supposedly banks are getting in the way of that grand scheme. And in other words, markets can be used as a way to subvert things like fossil fuels. Step four, ever since 9-11, these politicians have wanted banking groups out of their inner circles and have actively been making steps in order to remove their technological influence. Step five, which is where we're currently at, is that the politicians or elites are trying to build up up crypto money trading lending whatever to such a degree that it will inevitably crash all around the world which will lead to a need for a new system which is when they can then step in and create the new gold standard most drugs are benevolent is saying that most drugs if not all drugs are actually helpful to the human body but are therefore stigmatized or poisoned by the powers that be so that we don't become too powerful. This is considered because drugs can possibly unlock new potential in the human brain, which would be bad to the people who want to subjugate us and keep us under their rule if we suddenly sort of evolved. A lot of this goes back to the stoned ape theory, which is the idea that the reason we evolved from monkeys into what we are now is that monkeys eventually figured out how to use hallucinogenics, which opened up new brain pathways, which created us. So in other words, 
our leaders who want us under their thumb do not want us to go through another cycle of evolution. Closely related to that is the theory of proto-humans. Proto-humans is the idea that there was more than just one kind of pre-human like we think there was. Like for example, the Neanderthal DNA, which every human has a portion of, can actually be found in different variations and even mixed with different kind of genomes depending on what region of the world you're in. For example, in some parts of the world, in the portion that would mostly be Neanderthal, there is something known as Denisovan DNA, which is believed to be a competitor to the Neanderthal gene. This is implying that there was a lot more complicated roots of humanity than we may think there are. And in other words, probably very violent, competition led to the modern humanity that we know today. Dublin, Wisconsin is the town that doesn't exist. Supposedly there was a town in the Sparta Green Bay area of Wisconsin that just disappeared in between the 80s and 90s. Officially there exists no records of it, however there is still tourist memorabilia that people have. Certain people have memories of a small town being destroyed by either a fire or a gas leak, depending on who you ask. And people even supposedly received radio transmissions from radio stations in Dublin all the way into the late 90s. Whenever I was doing research for this, there were like a thousand people who went missing in the late 80s and early 90s around the Green Bay area. And also the guys who were supposedly receiving the radio signals were all dead. So I'm sure that's not troubling at all. Finland doesn't exist originally comes from the same Blyfield logic that I mentioned in tier 3 I think it was, which essentially follows the whole logic of, have you ever been to Finland? Do you know anyone from Finland? Well then Finland just doesn't exist, if you answer no to both of those. It's along the whole lines of believing only what you see, and furthermore if you're from Finland, you're a fed, if you know someone from Finland, they're a fed, and if you've ever visited Finland, the feds tricked you. Also in research, I found this copy pasta that is too funny to not mention. So the population of Finland is about 6.5 million people. Now when comparing that to the population of the entire world, which is about 7.2 billion, Finland makes up 0.09% of the world's population. It's not 1%, it's not even a tenth of a percent. Or in other words, 99.9% .9 of people who exist in the world are not from Finland. We get this number from government census, which government census has a percent error of about 1%. Or in other words, about 10 times the amount of percent that Finland makes up in the world. In other words, by statistical standards, there's a pretty solid chance that Finland does not exist. So if you're from Finland, uh, I hate to be the one to break the news to you, but you're not real, sorry. Also, it's so wild that like sitting here just talking into a camera, there's a solid chance that someone from Finland will see this. The internet's crazy, man. Number stations exist as coded radio messages that are used to send transmissions to foreign intelligence agencies from behind enemy lines. Or think of it this way. Say during the Cold War there was a Russian spy in the United States, and he needs to get information back to his Russian handlers. Well, he can't just get on a radio and begin saying exactly what he wants to tell them because then anyone could listen in and anyone could figure out what he's doing. But if he was to just send numbers, that corresponded to a code grid that the Russians had, well then no one would know what he's trying to say except for the people he wants to hear it. Now I need to make it clear, this is not a conspiracy theory. This is a very open practice that has existed all the way from World War I in which they did the same thing with Morse code. And during the Cold War, this was a very preferred method of transmitting information out of the country. However, what's interesting is the proliferation of how they exist today. To just give an example, there are several old radio towers that exist in a sort of swampland just outside of St. Petersburg, Russia. For the past 40 years, there's been a broadcast coming out of there that has been titled MDZHB, and all that it is is one continuous droning noise, and every few seconds there's a sound that sounds similar to a foghorn. Not only that, but about once or twice a week, either a man or woman will come on and just say random words in Russian, implying that whatever words are being said is a sort of code. And if you've got a radio that can pick up on the signal since it's shortwave, you can tune in to 4625KHZ and listen to it at any time. The leading theory with this radio station is that it's potentially part of the Russian government, which explains why they don't do anything about it or really care that it's there, and furthermore that it is a dead hand signal, or in other words, 
that monotone string is keeping something from happening, say a nuclear device. These are actually in themselves not a conspiracy as there have been devices that are made to pick up on a certain radio frequency and if that frequency ever stops, the device detonates. This is sort of like a last laugh protocol. So say if there was some explosive in a foreign country and that foreign country attacked Russia, therefore destroying the radio signal, they get blown up as well. This is just one of many number stations, and there are a whole lot weirder ones I found, such as the Lincolnshire Poacher. I found enough information that I'm definitely going to be doing a deeper dive on this, just to talk about all the different number stations that have been found around the world, because there are some weird ones. Everest Cover-Ups is speaking of the series of deaths that occur on Everest that are supposedly covered up. I've already spoke before about the Sherpas of Mount Everest and the legends of the Himalayan zombies in the regions around. However, this one has a a bit more wider stretching application. See, you may not know this, but if someone dies on Mount Everest, they don't recover the body. The reason for it is because once you pass a certain point in altitude, it is way too dangerous to try to get people to recover something than it is to just leave it there. Also, it's so cold that in most cases, the body never really decomposes. What this means is there are near perfectly preserved bodies all over the mountain of Mount Everest, and not only that, they are used as trail markers in order for climbers to find their way up. In researching this, there's a lot of weird stories, like they talk about reaching the destination of Green Boots Cave because there's a dead body out front that has green boots. Almost all these deaths are attributed to exhaustion, which makes sense considering the feats that they have to accomplish in such a low oxygen environment. Furthermore, there are nearly 200 bodies on the mountain itself. But here's what's weird. So I said most of them don't decompose, but some of them do. And some of them decompose immediately next to bodies that don't decompose at all. Which means you can have two people up on the mountain, each there for decades, one is a skeleton and the other seems like a perfectly intact person who's just sleeping. Combine that with the fact that certain hikers have reported that bodies have been found where they're not supposed to be, and then combine that with the Himalayan zombies legend that I mentioned earlier, and then mix all that in with the legends of the Sherpas who guard the secret Shangri-La, which is considered an entrance to hollow earth and protected by spirits, and the implications get implicitous. Tao conspiracy is a conspiracy that's kind of obvious, but you may have never thought about that the paper towel dispensers that look like they have a camera in it absolutely have a camera in it. <laughs> now, of course, it's illegal to put a camera in a bathroom, for obvious reasons. However, when has that ever stopped certain powers that be from spying on their people? This wouldn't just stop at the motion sensors on paper towel dispensers, but also urinals and toilets because gross, and fills in the loophole that in such a surveillance state, there would be so many obvious blind spots that people can get away with whatever they're doing unless they aren't blind spots and they just want you to think they are. All religions are the same is the concept that's kind of been mentioned in tears earlier, that all religions can be traced back to a single founder. So like for example, whenever I mentioned the Anunnaki coming down from space or your ideas of Jesus or what have you, the idea being that there was one original event that happened and then as culture spread out, the story simply adapted with each culture. This would explain the reason that so many different cultures have the same ideas of heaven and hell, even if they're named different, ideas of a godhead, and summing of salvation either through works or belief, all the way down to concepts like angels and demons. Essentially saying that all religions are the same, just extra steps away from whatever the original source was. Valley of Lost Candles is a reference to stolen props from the 1967 movie, The Valley of the Dolls. The plot of Valley of the Dolls was a group of girls who go to Hollywood in order to become famous and slowly have to give away pieces of themselves in one way or the other in order to achieve that goal. Given the mysterious nature of things that happen underground in Hollywood, the movie was kind of seen at a look behind the veil of what goes on in the industry. Supposedly, several of the props such as candles that were used on the movie were used in actual witchcraft and carried bad spirits with them. After the movie was over, several of these props went missing. One story even says that they were stolen by critic Roger Ebert. Theories in this lead all the way to say, 
that perhaps one of the reasons that one of the film's lead roles, Sharon Tate, was killed in such a grisly manner is because she made the spirits upset by losing their possessions. Advanced Cryptozoology is exactly what it says. Advanced levels of standard cryptozoology, or in other words, the stories of creatures that may or may not exist. Now, when most people think of cryptids, they think of things like Bigfoot and Mothman and other known characters in cryptid lore. However, there is a wealth of creatures out there that exist that the majority of people have never even heard of. Things that exist in an esoteric fashion, or are figments of the mind that have been manifested into creatures. This all gives the implication that the world is much more proliferated with creatures that we can't explain than we like to think. I'm going to save it there because my next video is going to be a huge dive into cryptids and advanced cryptids themselves with a special guest who I'm excited for. So. This is a teaser for that, just wait. Asian Overlord's Triad is in reference to the idea that mobs in Asia have much more power than most people think. Specifically Eastern Asia, in which regions like Hong Kong have one of the most powerful crime syndicates in the world. The idea being that by running connections back and figuring out who pays who, these crime syndicates control a lot of the politics that exist in the Chinese government. Not only that, but the idea that the reason crime is allowed to be so proliferated in the underground world of Hong Kong is because the Chinese government is allowing them to exist and they have a sort of symbiotic relationship in order to keep Hong Kong in check. This applies further to say that the same can be said about the Yakuza in Japan, and even Asian mobs that supposedly act independently throughout other parts of the world are actually controlled by a centralized government. Looking at dark energy is our next super weird physics concept. So known matter in the universe makes up like 20% of everything that supposedly exists, whereas dark energy makes up about 25. The rest is dark matter, but we're not talking about that right now. Supposedly dark energy exists absolutely everywhere and is, does not conform to any of our understanding of electronics, magnetics, heat, or anything that we can really use to prove its existence. The reason this is theorized is because gaps that exist in our understanding of how molecules and the world operate around us. And several believe that we are on the fringe of technology to being able to create something that can detect this dark energy. While some some believe this can be used as a sort of power source that would be pretty much infinite considering it makes up more matter than the matter that exists in our known universe. Others theorize that perhaps the reason we can't see it is because we're not supposed to, and perhaps these are the fibers that hold us together from a fabricated reality we exist in. The 2006 volleyball incident is the tragedy that never happened. See, a lot of people remember that there was an event of some kind, either a school shooting or a bombing that happened during a high school volleyball game in 2006. Stories range, but everyone remembers that it came from either the Nebraska or Dakota's region of the United States, and several people remember specific details of people saying that it was worse than Columbine. There are several stories that exist online of people traveling to, say, Mount Rushmore, and then hearing on the radio that there has been a, quote, massacre at a high school. People remember having conversations about how awful it is and how this relates to the bigger issue of gun control. And even weird details like the gym had a blue mascot and in crime scene images, the net from the volleyball game was still up. However, there's no record of this and there's no official reports that ever happened. And although people can vary on small details of the story, everyone universally agrees that it did happen who remember it. Most who believe the 2006 volleyball incident say it is an extreme example of the Mandela effect or some form of government cover-up for a reason that isn't really known. Artificial Aliens says that perhaps aliens aren't just non-carbon based, like we began to theorize, but are not organic based or organic in any sense that we understand. You know those random radio waves that we hear from space every now and then? What if that's simply these things manner of communication? What if these things don't even have a form of consciousness and exist as a life so far set apart from ours that we don't really comprehend it? Some even tie this into the greater theory of humanity cycle, which I'll mention at some point either in this iceberg or a different video, but the idea that like a million years ago we were a functioning technological society and we sent these artificial creatures into space and they began to proliferate for themselves. And now these aliens that we're talking to are simply creatures we created out there in the cosmos somewhere. The secret Mongolian empire is in reference to the idea that the Mongolian empire never existed. Think about it this way. 
The Mongolian Empire would be the only empire that had no linguistic or cultural effects on the world around them after their disappearance. Not only that, but there exists no architecture to prove that they were ever a society structured together, and yes, while they were recorded as a nomadic society, there should still be something that shows where they are and where they inhabited. On top of that, there exists no Mongolian folklore or form of religion or legend or anything like that. It seems as they simply appeared then disappeared at random. Now what we do know existed was Genghis Khan and the actions he committed in the area that is now known as China. The idea behind this theory is that Genghis Khan went on to create another government or society that wanted to continue to exist in the modern world and so as to cover up their history to not appear as barbarians, they created the Mongolian Empire as a farce in order to write away their bad history. Non-space is another crazy physics concept and the too long didn't read version would be a reverse black hole. The concept would essentially work like this. So a black hole as we understand it is a gravitational center that is so intense it pulls everything in that's around it, including light itself. Okay, well let's say we created a vacuum through whatever means that sucked all matter out of a certain area, let's say an area the size of this water bottle. We've done that before, right? We've created vacuums in an area. But what if we used an energy that was so concentrated, we didn't just take all of the atoms out of this area, we took gravity itself out of this area. So now we have a perfectly absolute empty vacuum of space. Well, what that would do all at once is create an implosion when all the gravity around this area immediately rushes to fill it it would move at a rate so fast and so powerful that we don't really have numbers to comprehend it. So if you're thinking about this from a mass and energy perspective, the amount of energy being created by no change in mass would be astronomical. And while this is a concept that would normally be impossible, concepts now being proven with high energy plasma say that we may be able to get an energy high enough to be able to remove that and therefore create even more energy through the implosion of gravity around it. This could, in theory, create a near infinite energy source or at the very least a means of harvesting gravity as a form of energy. Or as I mentioned however many years ago, using a machine that can use gravity as a means of transportation through space. That's one possibility. The other possibility is it creates a super black hole and we all die in the blink of an eye. Uh, either way, not our problem anymore. New Zealand 8th continent is saying that the country of New Zealand is not part of the Australian continent as most believe, but actually its own separate entity. This has all but been confirmed as New Zealand and New Caledonia have been analyzed underwater and it's been shown that they exist on a plate separate of that of Australia. The theory being that whatever landmass New Zealand was a part of broke away from the shelves around it some however many long years ago, and New Zealand is one of the only structures that still stick up from this sunken eighth continent. And if once again you remember how I mentioned in past years, there are several theories that there are missing continents or one giant missing continent that would explain where different societies moved and different societies influence on the world today, such as Lemuria. The answers to these missing gaps in societal history could exist in the sunken part of New Zealand, or if you're me, the underwater part of New Zealand is where the caves to Agartha are, and you can't tell me otherwise. And that is it for part two of tier seven. As I mentioned, uh, information for the curls in the description below, and there is a, in my opinion, very cool video coming out soon discussing cryptids and the like. So stay tuned for that if you're interested, but above all else, I just want to say thank you for watching. You all mean the most. Um, watching this channel grow as much as it has has been a blessing and I'm amazed and it's all thanks to you guys. So sincerely, thank you for watching. Thank you to all my subscribers to get me from where I am. Thank you to all of my patrons and thank you to my top tier patrons. Um, so I am going to be kind of switching up the top tier patron thing as the top tier patrons is quickly getting to the point that's going to be a five minute ad read. So as you can see, I'm going to begin putting the names on the screen. And as a way to make up for that, I am going to begin streaming on the patron only discord. Uh, just to talk to people and get to understand and hopefully it's sort of a way to make up for not saying the names and I'm sorry about it but uh, you all have been far too good to me and so many people have been a blessing that um, it's getting infeasible to name everyone specifically. There will probably be videos in the future that I specifically uh, name just if I'm feeling fruity but for now we're just going to leave it at this and see how it goes. So thank you all for watching. 
Um, it means the most. Like I said, new videos coming out soon. I hope you all have a good day and I will see you in the next one. Bye.